The nuclear issue is absolutely terrifying. All you have to do is look at it for one second to know how terrifying it is. And I know it's not glamorous work to continue beating the drum about that issue, but it is a hugely important issue. That's the voice of David Sirota, Academy Award nominated co-creator of the hit Netflix film Don't Look Up, a movie about a group of scientists warning the public and government about an incoming planet-destroying comet and their challenge to be heard. In time for this weekend's Oscar ceremony, he's today's guest for this special bonus episode of Press the Button, a pleasure spent podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here's your host, Delphine Vigil. All right, welcome everyone, and thanks for listening to Press the Button. My name is Delphine. I'm the Director of Communications at Plowshares Fund, filling in as host for this episode. And today we have a very special guest, David Sirota. David is an award-winning journalist with The Daily Poster, a truly independent investigative journalism project. They cover politics, business, and corporate power. Check it out at dailyposter.com. David was also a presidential campaign speechwriter for Bernie Sanders. And most recently, as in very recently, David is an Academy Award nominee for the Oscar category of Best Original Screenplay for his work in co-writing Don't Look Up. That is, of course, the Netflix smash hit film. It follows the plight of two scientists attempting to warn humanity about a comet on track to destroy the planet. It's hilarious. It's depressing, frightening, inspiring, and it's hitting very close to home, breaking streaming records left and right. David, congratulations on this wild ride and welcome to Press the Button. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So starting off, don't look up. It falls into the apocalyptic humanity stopping the world from ending, which is very much our jam here at Plowshares Fun. But instead of the typical Mad Max, Will Smith, I am legend route, you and your partner, Adam McKay, made a very different creative choice. Can you tell our listeners what sparked the idea and unique storytelling approach for this film? Sure. So uh, after Adam made the movie Vice, um, he and I were talking and I said to him, you know, you really need to use your superpowers of intertwining comedy and politics for something on the climate crisis. And he said, I know, I just haven't been able to figure out exactly what the overall storyline is. And I don't want to do a kind of post-apocalyptic dystopia movie. And we kept talking. And at one point I had reported uh, some stories on climate change and I was lamenting to him that they were good stories, but they didn't seem to land in a way where they would stick. And I complained. I said, it, it really does a lot of days feel like an asteroid's headed towards earth and nobody cares. And he said, wait a minute, maybe there's an idea there for a movie. And so we started batting back and forth, different ideas for scenes. One idea was the president tries to pass a bill through Congress to fund uh, an anti-asteroid initiative, but the government shuts down. Uh, Congress can't even meet. We spitballed ideas like that for a while. And then he went off and said, I'm going to go write a script. And he wrote a draft of a script and showed it to me. And I gave him notes and we tweaked it and we played with it. And he went back and polished it. And a couple of weeks later said, I think Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence are interested. And I kind of eye rolled. In, in a friendly way. I did. I, I mean, I, you know, you hear a lot of things are going to happen and then they never happen. And, he's, yeah. he, and then about a week later, he said, listen, they're going to send over the paperwork. This is, this is actually happening. And I was like, you can't be serious. I mean, this is, this is really actually going to happen. And it happened on quite a timetable. Uh, it got delayed at one point because of COVID, but then they decided to press forward and filming it in the pre-vaccine winter of COVID 2020 into 2021, which was a, a whole other wild ride. And Ultimately, here we are now with a movie that I think clearly uh, has been a major success in terms of viewership, size of audience, people talking about it. And I'm just thrilled that we were able to make a movie with, I think, a familiar kind of story, but with a unique take that used a familiar kind of story to deliver a really serious set of messages that you don't often see in those kinds of, you know, Armageddon style movies. Yeah, I think I read you said it isn't prophecy, it isn't destiny, it's cautionary. Can you tell us what you mean and what maybe perhaps the overall caution is for the viewers? Sure. So spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie, I'm going to spoil a little, a little bit of it, um, particularly the end. At the end, the asteroid ends up hitting the planet. Uh, and I think, 
you can walk away from the movie and say, oh, uh, this is just a movie about how our media system, political system, governmental system is screwed up and there's nothing we can do to change it. But there's a line in the in the movie towards the end where Leonardo DiCaprio, who's the scientist trying to sound the alarm, he says, you know, we could have stopped it. And to me, that's one of the most important lines of the whole movie, which is that he's saying to essentially to the audience in a lot of ways, the, the movie viewing audience, not the audience in the movie, but he's really the way I read it. He's saying to the audience, all of us watching the movie, he's saying we still are at the point in the movie where we can stop it. And we can stop or at least mitigate in a real way something like climate change. But we have to be able to talk to each other. We have to be able to accept scientific facts rather than using scientific facts and, and misinformation uh, as cannon fodder in a political war and a culture war and a media war. Uh, and so when I say that, that this movie is not prophecy or destiny, what I mean is I don't think the climate crisis means that we're doomed. I think it means we're doomed if we don't do anything. I think it means we're doomed if we continue to have a media and a political system that behaves the way it does in frivolizing everything and distracting from the real crises in front of us. But I don't think the movie is prophecy or destiny. I think it's cautionary. It's saying to us, we need to make some really fundamental changes to how we behave with the technology and the government and the powers and abilities that we have right now. Right. And it's definitely struck a nerve. It's divided a lot of opinions, though, not in the typical ideological borderline. Here's what side I'm on. Scientists have praised it. Neil deGrasse Tyson said it was something like it was so on the nose that it's practically a documentary. The Hollywood Reporter called it, and this is my favorite, a cynical, insufferably smug satire. So I don't, is this a classic case of you spot it, you got it, where people, whether they're media scientists, DC establishment, they're just seeing themselves in the film? You know, look, I, I think the movie was going to, I always knew the movie was going to generate all kinds of responses uh, from all kinds of different people. And, and I think th this is, in some ways, it's not a consensus movie among critics, in part because it's a movie about the here and now, uh, and it's also political. And when you make something about the here and now, outside of the safety and comfort of, let's say, history, uh, things that have already been litigated in history, or outside of the safety and comfort of complete and total fantasy, something that's so not real, you don't really have to worry about it. When you're actually in the zone of the here and now about political topics, people have strong opinions about the here and now, and they have particularly strong opinions about politics. So I'm not surprised that there have been. Uh, reactions all across the board. I don't think the movie is quote unquote smug. I don't actually know what that really means. I think the movie is populist. I think the movie is not made for uh, one or two small audiences. This is a movie made for everybody. Uh, it's a movie that's designed to make everybody think, and it's designed so that everybody can have their opinions on it uh, without having to know pieces of esoteric detail or film esoterica and the like. I mean, this really was designed to be a movie for the largest possible audience. Uh, and by the way, I think that uh, was aided uh, by the uh, amazing cast. I mean, these cast members brought their own audiences to yeah. this movie. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. I, I truly appreciate uh, these cast members uh, being willing to take something of a risk on a movie that they knew was going to be this controversial. Now, to be clear, these are all well-known actors. They're not, this is not some huge act of martyrdom for them. It's not really a huge act of sacrifice for them. But the easier path in the media and entertainment world is to just avoid controversy. And what I appreciate is that these actors said, no, this is an important enough project for us to be a part of, even knowing that it's going to draw uh, some pretty harsh criticism, uh, some pretty nasty pushback. And I think the fact that they were willing to put their names to this and, and their abilities into this project, I think it really uh, speaks well of them. And I hope that, that the success of the movie creates more opportunity and more demand for these kinds of movies that ask tough questions and wrestle with uncomfortable issues. Big time, because smug critics aside, the organic reach is astounding. And some numbers here, 
Over 150 million hours viewed on Netflix. That's nearly 40 million hours more than the next nine popular shows combined. An estimated, I've seen references to 200 million people haven't seen this. And here's my favorite. Nielsen reports a viewership of 1.6 billion minutes viewed. I don't even know what that means, but that's like TikTok territory. What do those story numbers tell you? It sounds like people do want to explore these sort of subject matters, I would think. What do you think? You know, I think it says a couple things. I think one, it says that obviously something, I mean, uh, the mundane, it, it says that a lot of people are drawn to movies with cast members that they really appreciate, and they will particularly respond and go watch a movie like that that's on the world's largest streaming platform. So that was a, a great foundation. But I think that would explain if the movie was like a pretty decently large movie. The size of this audience is way beyond just a pretty decently sized movie. I mean, this is a truly a global phenomenon. I mean, you see the the term don't look up or just look up is now being used throughout the media across the globe. This audience size is enormous. And what I think that actually says, that additional boost from just it being a big movie, I think that says that there is a pent up demand for content that challenges people's thinking that wrestles with issues that we're that we're scared of that we're uncomfortable with issues that we know are huge issues but that we don't talk about a lot because it's scary to talk about those issues climate change is a perfect example i mean climate change is a terrifying issue undoubtedly it's a terrifying phenomenon and if you're not scared about it uh, it probably means you're not paying all that much attention to it. Uh, and in part, that's what climate denialism uh, is is kind of uh, relies on, is that not that people deny the science of climate change or deny that it's happening, but just deny in a softer way, deny that it's that urgent or deny that it's that big a deal uh, or deny wanting to hear about it because it's too scary. And so what I think this movie shows is, is that people actually are interested in content that wrestles with those issues and in some, some cases laughs uh, at, at some of the ways we process those issues. But the point being that I hope this is a moment that we look back on in 10 years and we say, you know, when they made Don't Look Up, there was this idea that people would be squeamish about a movie wrestling with the end of the world, wrestling allegorically uh, with climate change. And actually, that was the beginning. That was when we saw that there really is a huge audience for this kind of content that we look back at 10 years from now and we say that was the beginning of a kind of rebirth of movies, television shows, and news programming that really gets us out of our comfort zone. And everything you just described there really relates directly to our issue at Plasher so it's nuclear weapons, whether people want to think about it, don't want to think about it, actually care in the assumptions we make. And for us, nuclear weapons certainly intersects with environmental issues because nuclear war, there is no environment. Uh, there's references to the comet in the film as having the power of a billion Hiroshima bombs and plans to outfit drones with nukes to save the day. Can you tell us about the cameo role that nuclear weapons played in the movie and any message maybe? What inspired you to include that in the story and what kind of message you might want to convey about nuclear weapons? The movie is obviously a metaphor. And I think while the climate metaphor is the most apt, the most on the nose, I certainly think the metaphor also works when it comes to nuclear war itself, that nuclear proliferation, if you take the metaphor in that direction, nuclear proliferation is the comet. There are inherent dangers uh, with nuclear proliferation. It's pretty terrifying to conclude that nuclear proliferation or the track that we're on right now automatically is going to lead us to uh, nuclear incineration. I don't think any of us can automatically say that. We can say that the more nuclear weapons that are out there, the higher a percent chance there is that something's going to go wrong and that they will be used in a truly catastrophic way uh, like they've been used before. And so I think the metaphor works for that too. And I think scientists and experts have been warning about that 
in the same way that the uh, planetary scientists in the movie have were warning about the comet. So I think that's why actually the the metaphor of the movie is so powerful. And some people have said the, that the metaphor is the pandemic or the, the comet is the pandemic. And I think that gets to the deeper issue of what the movie is actually about, that the movie is on one level a metaphor for something like climate. But more deeply, it's a movie about how or whether we can really communicate with each other. That it's a movie about whether we're willing to prioritize and preference scientific facts, verifiable facts, preference them, make them central to our politics, to our media discourse, or whether we are insistent on preserving a media and political culture uh, that brushes those facts to the side, frivolizes them, ignores them, or simply weaponizes them in a kind of cheap partisan political war. And if it's going to be the latter, if we're going to keep doing that, then we are tempting fate. And it also seems at the core, it's also a story about trust and the erosion of trust and faith that people have in the government and being able to just, you know, most people don't think about nuclear weapons on a regular basis. And just the fact that you have that in the story gets people thinking about it, which is, it's a big win for us. I, I think that these things exist. They're dangerous. There was actually a spoiler alert. At this point, considering how many numbers of people have viewed this, if you haven't viewed it yet, you should probably update your VCR. But there is actual nuclear accident there in the film as well. Can you talk more about facts? I think I saw you had a line about how do we as a society process facts, agree on facts, and as a journalist, did you see like a time when this really took to a whole other level of being able to agree upon facts and not use them as weapons against one another? My own story that sticks out to me in my own experience uh, on that came in 2016. I was working at the International Business Times and Newsweek, and me and a colleague reported out a very, I think, a very important story all based on government documents. And the story was basically, this is in the, in the cauldron of the 2016 presidential campaign. And we published this story and it was all grounded in facts. You could see it, you could see the documents. I mean, there was no question on the facts. And my somewhat naive presumption, I mean, I wasn't a complete idiot, but my somewhat naive presumption was this will be processed on the merits. This, this story will be processed on the merits. And quite the opposite happened. The story was picked up and touted by conservative Republican uh, news outlets, and we were berated by liberals. Then a few months later, we did a big story and the entire uh, tables were turned. This was waved around by the same liberals who had attacked us as a great piece of journalism and conservatives were very mad that we published this. And to me, the takeaway was it was actually kind of depressing, which is not that I, I was completely naive about it, but it was this very powerful reminder to me as a journalist that we now live in a world where it doesn't matter as much. It still matters a little bit, but it doesn't matter as much whether the merits of a, a piece of reporting are accurate, true, and important. And what matters more to many parts of the audience is whether what is reported, whether true or not, serves uh, the audience's partisan political goals in an election or in a culture war or in the media war of the day. That's disappointing to me as a journalist because, granted, nothing's perfect, but you, you want to have the core belief that if I surface an important fact about our government leaders, our politicians, et cetera, et cetera, that the way a democracy works is the journalists surface those facts in service of the population being more informed to make more informed decisions about picking elected officials, uh, about who to pressure for which kinds of policies. And it, 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 a lot of times it doesn't feel like that's the way it is. And I think that's the world that's reflected in Don't Look Up, that there are scenes in this movie where the scientists are talking about, look, the asteroid is coming and they're being sort of nitpicked by, at one, in one part, a sort of a Fox News-ish kind of outlet that that's sort of doesn't want to accept that because it doesn't necessarily serve their short-term political goals. And that's a problem. That is a huge problem. And it's, it's frankly, it's depressing to me as a journalist. 
Well, as a good journalist, you should piss off both sides, and you certainly have a track record of doing that. And it shouldn't be, these facts are on my side, and they reinforce my talking points. And that is certainly it. Uh, uh, you know, a storyline you really, really highlighted and so wonderfully in this film. And the behind the scenes of the sort of DC machine, could you talk about your experience as a speechwriter and the work you've done in the Bernie Sanders campaign and how that might have affected the direction of your film? Did you have a side notebook? Sure. I mean, I, I look, I worked for Bernie Sanders. Um, now it is uh, 20 plus years ago, uh, right out of college. I was his press secretary in the US House. Then I worked on his presidential campaign in 2020. And one of the things that influenced me when I first met him, and obviously when I worked on his presidential campaign, was his analysis, not such a, a rocket science analysis, but you know, corporate media doesn't take serious issues seriously. And uh, I think that's obvious. And I think that's one of Bernie's core laments, even today, that the political Washington media is uh, filled with gossip, filled with, uh, you know, uh, palace drama, the, the horse race coverage of elections, and much less coverage of how policy might impact ordinary people. Uh, I, I put it this way, 99% of politics is corporations and the wealthy stealing from everybody else, and yet less than 1% of corporate media coverage of politics is about that theft. And that's a huge problem that's baked into this movie, that view. And frankly, it is my view. It is my opinion. But I also think it, it's, it's kind of indisputable. I mean, it, I, I really believe it is indisputable that on the issues of the day, you can, if you watch carefully, you can see how they're being skewed. I mean, I think right now we're talking right now in, in the middle of a big debate about inflation. And you'll notice that a lot of the debate about inflation is about either supposed so-called wage inflation. Oh, workers are being paid too much or workers got too much uh, COVID uh, relief. And so they have more, too much money in their hands. And that drives up prices. Very little you hear talked about, about how uh, executive pay at the top has been skyrocketing. Uh, that corporations are paying uh, out dividends, uh, huge dividends to their shareholders. That oligopolies and monopoly companies are using the moniker of inflation to simply ratchet up prices to boost their profit. That latter set of issues is not really talked about in the inflation conversation in corporate media. Why? Because corporate media is corporate. Corporate media is not all that interested in topics that may offend its sponsors. Uh, and so I think that's reflected in this movie in the sense that corporate media is so often distracting us from uncomfortable truths because they're making a business decision, partially a business decision uh, to benefit uh, their own sponsors, but also partly a business decision to not necessarily challenge the audience, uh, to not necessarily make the audience feel uncomfortable. They believe a better business proposition to simply comfort the audience, to simply coddle the audience uh, rather than, than inform the audience of things that the, that parts of the audience may not like. And that's a real problem in a democracy when our government, the, the whole theory of democracy is that people become informed with facts that they like or, or, or don't like, but at least they have them at their fingertips. My favorite scene in the film, or one of them, there's so many, is that where the top editors at the New York Herald are reviewing social media clicks that perform below basic traffic and weather story. And I mean, I remember working in newsrooms where there was debates of whether or not you could even have a Twitter account as a reporter. So that's how far removed I am from understanding how these decisions are made. But they ultimately decide, as is a planet, uh, you know, extinction level event, um, we've taken the story as far as it goes. That stuff really happens, right? I mean, this is a real modern conundrum. And I'm wondering, I mean, with the Daily Poster, how you take on that dilemma. Because you want to sell records, right? But you don't want Milli Vanilli journalism. Yes. I mean, that is, that is a, a huge dilemma that we face in our work every single day. The, the tension between what topics should we focus on that we know will get short-term uh, uh, virality, short-term audience growth versus what topics are really important. To be clear, I, I don't think those two things are always intention. I think there is a Venn diagram in which 
covering serious issues, you can do it in a compelling way or find compelling stories so that those stories can travel uh, to a broad audience. But I do think sometimes that those issues are intention. And I think that's the toughest thing to deal with. Our movie, now granted, it's a climate allegory. Granted, it's got a lot of things going for it. It's a movie, it's fiction, it's fun, it's comedy. It's got a big cast. Okay, I grant you all of that. But many of those things are marshalling creativity and imagination in service of provoking thought, critical thought, on a critical issue, climate change. And so what it says to me is we in, in the journalism world, we in the, in the entertainment world, have to challenge ourselves to think, quote unquote, outside the box about different ways we can embed climate coverage into the news in a compelling way, uh, different ways we can embed climate into movies and TV shows in a compelling way. I have great faith in, especially in America, which has an amazing entertainment uh, and media culture, I mean, in terms of creativity, I have great confidence that that creativity and imagination is there and can be marshaled. And, and maybe I'm just feeling that way because the movie has done so well. Uh, and I was around some of the most talented people uh, in that space, Adam McKay, uh, Nick Patel, uh, Hank Corwin, the editor. I mean, it's just an amazing amount of creativity there. But I think this is a big challenge to the journalism industry. That yeah. You've got to get people into that industry who have creative minds about how to take what's going on in our world, focus on the important things that are going on in our world and make it compelling. I just reject the idea that, for instance, the climate cataclysm that threatens the human species is somehow not, uh, cannot be presented as a compelling audience generating story. I just reject that. I got one more question for you. And thank you so much for taking the time. And again, congratulations on a truly remarkable film. This one's for my, my 12 year old daughter, Paloma. There's a reference to an escape pod spaceship for up to 2000 elites with like cryogenic chambers. So my question to you is, you know something we don't know? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. But I, but I think that that part of the metaphor, uh, I think is important. Um, and it's one of my favorite parts of the movie. Because there, there are really two messages there. One is a message that the elites and powerful will always be looking for a way to enrich themselves and save themselves right. from the problems the rest of us face. I, I just think we know that. Uh, so I, I'm not saying that there, there's anything specific here. I don't necessarily think they have an escape pod, but I think it's the idea that, that the people pulling the strings about the supposed solutions and who are dropping the ball in positions of power, uh, they're also looking out for themselves uh, to protect themselves at the end of the day. But I also think there's the other piece of that, which is when they land on the other livable planet, they get off the ship and it doesn't go very well for them. So there's sort of a, a message there of like, yeah, maybe you're going to save yourself, but like, you're not like, what are you really saving yourself for when it comes to something as giant as the climate crisis? Well, when you're ready to do the prequel on uh, nuclear weapons, please give us a ring at Plowshares. <laughs> you know, great stuff. And, and I understand the Daily Poster is, uh, there might be a new name coming uh, for people yes. to check out your work. Where yes. should they go? Yes, we're going to be expanding, uh, hiring some more reporters. It's going to be called uh, The Lever. You can find the job listings at levernews.com and you can subscribe to the Daily Poster at dailyposter.com. And if you become a subscriber, you will automatically be a subscriber to The Lever when we convert over in a couple of weeks. And I just want to thank you uh, and Plowshares for all of your work. It is really important work. The nuclear issue is absolutely terrifying. All you have to do is look at it for one second to know how terrifying it is. And I know it's not glamorous work to continue beating the drum about that issue, but it is a hugely important issue. So thank you for your work. Well, right back at you. And thank you so much, David. Really appreciate your taking the time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited in Washington, D.C. by Lauren Billett and Angela Kelly. And in San Francisco by Jacqueline Shing and 
Jumping Widget. With research and assistance from Alex Hall, Harry Tarpey, and Desiree Zipetis. Audio engineering and sound design by Jacqueline Shane. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.